everyone. I'm Tanya Johnson. I'm with South Doyle Middle School. Hello, and I hope everyone is doing well and we miss you all. This week, we are looking at Activity 1 for Summer. All activities and handouts can be found under the Student Resource tab at Knox County Schools website, www.knoxschools.org. If this video is hard to understand, one, turn on closed captions if available, two, adjust the playback speed to slow down the video, three, consider watching short clips, then pause, listen, and watch again. Four, ask someone in your home to watch the video with you. Stop frequently and talk to your partner about what you heard and understood. This week, we are going to be looking at specific phenotypes within a population uh, and how it can increase the probability of survival in that species. There is specific evidence from geology, paleontology, and comparative anatomy to support this idea. The essential question for this week is how does a change in phenotype uh, in a population impacts survival of the population. So keep this in mind as we go through this video. Reviewing some vocabulary in week four uh, was a great overview about adaptation and survival of the fittest. Thinking back or maybe going back to review, an adaptation is a change or a process of change by which an organism becomes better suited to its environment and assists with survival. Uh, you have seen different types of adaptations in animals and, and plants in your life. Uh, structural adaptations, think about animals that have horns for defense. Think about organisms that have fins to swim or anything that has camouflage to blend in. There's also behavioral adaptations. These are innate actions, innate meaning that you are born with them, uh, of organisms that help it live and benefit, such as uh, herding animals. Uh, they can survive to help uh, defend it or forage for food, uh, spotting predators, Socialization uh, promotes cooperation for survival. Think about our socialization. And there's physiological adaptations. These are involuntary processes. Uh, this is involuntary means that you don't have to think about them. Such as if you think about milk production in mammals or venomous species that can uh, poison prey. Then you looked at variation in week four. This is any difference between individuals of the same species. So think about us, for example. Uh, we, are, we are all very different. We have different eye color, different hair color, different height. And there's a couple of different types of variation. You can look at genotypic vario uh, variation. So if you look at what a genotype is, this is our actual genetic makeup. This is, is determined by her, our heredity. Um, the, the genotypic variation is due to the number and structure of chromosomes. Uh, this is not observable. This is going to be determined by alleles, and we're going to look at this in, in just a few moments. Then we have our phenotype. This is the observable characteristics. Uh, we can actually see this. Once again, going back to us humans, hair color, eye color, height. Um, and a lot of times in different organisms, this is very specific and it's an interaction of the genotype and the phenotype. And we'll look at an example of a flamingo and, and look at its color and how this interaction occurs. Uh, many, many times a trait is uh, confused with this variation, but a trait is, for example, the eye color. But the phenotypic expression is very specifically blue, brown, green, or, or any other variation of this. So what we're going to be looking at very specifically is the difference between genotype and phenotype and with the emphasis on phenotypic adaptations. So if you look at the genotype, that is the genes. This is the organ's code, if you will, for heredity. Whereas the phenotype is the environmental influences uh, on those genes. And this is the observable traits that we see. 
Uh, on this slide, there is a link. If you can uh, access this, please do so. There's a lot of good review information. Uh, go explore that. And once again, at any time this video, you need to pause it, review your packet, please do so, and uh, slow it down if needed. I'll also ex urge you to explore uh, different examples of genotype and phenotype as we go forward. So if you look at these um, examples, you can look at the flamingo. You see a pink one and a white one. The phenotypic expression is, is a huge um, environmental influence on this organism because of what it eats. So if you look at the different uh, organisms that it consumes out of the water, like shrimp, the more pink it's going to be, the less access it has to these organisms that have a certain um, color chemical in it, the more white it's going to be. So that is an environmental influence uh, that promotes this phenotypic expression in flamingos. Then if you look over at the eye color, there's more of an example of the alleles with your eye color. So when you get more into the genotype and Punnett squares, you'll work with this a little bit, but you see a big B, that's gonna be a dominant allele, a small B, this is recessive. And it tells you what these stand for. So the big B is gonna be a brown, a small B is going to be for blue, and it shows you the possible genotypes and what eye color you get. Uh, it can be a, a homozygous, heterozygous, uh, or a homozygous recessive. So you always have a dominant or recessive trait. These genotypes, once again, you cannot see this. This is not expressed, um, Physically, this is all in your DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, if you remember back in your studies. So once again, if you look at the flamingo, what it consumes is going to very much determine uh, its color and different variations of color, where you have the alleles are its genetic makeup. So if you're to differentiate between genotype and phenotype, take a moment and look, and I want you to think about how you could summarize this. So the gen genotype is the genetic makeup of the organism. This is the alleles of heredity, whereas the, the phenotype, this is the properties or the behaviors. This is the expression. Uh, once again, the genotype, the alleles, this is found in the DNA, and causes the phenotype to, to be the observable characteristics. Genotype, inherited by the offsprings. The phenotype, it depends on the genotype and the environment. Think back to the flamingo. They don't all have to be pink. They can be different variations of pink. They can be white. It depends on the environmental influences of food they have access to. The genotype is all heredity information. It can be expressed or suppressed. And the genotype is only that of expressed genes. What do you actually see? What hair color, what eye color, what color is the flamingo? If you think of giraffes, how long is the neck? What influence is that? Uh, what kind of food do they have to... We have reviewed phenotypic and genotypic variations. Going forward, you will know you're successful when you can use evidence to explain cause and effect relationships between phenotypic adaptations and survival. Use the link below to access a video going more in depth and providing further examples. Please access closed captions and slow down if needed. So what has red lips, looks like it has four legs, and lives under the water? Well, it's the red-lipped batfish, but 
Why would a fish need legs? Well, let's take a look at how this adaptation helps the red-lipped batfish survive. Wow, it looks like it's walking. These legs are actually the fish's pectoral fins, which have become leg-like over many generations. This adaptation helps the fish balance on the bottom and look for food. The red-lipped batfish is a type of anglerfish that lives off the Galapagos Islands. The word angler is used to describe a person who catches fish with a fishing pole. Like their human counterparts, anglerfish just sit still and lure in prey. The prey is attracted to a fishing pole-like projection that sticks out from above the fish's head. There are many species in the Galapagos Islands that have developed unique adaptations. So come on, let's take a look at another one. Next, we have the marine iguana. Instead of climbing trees and eating leaves like their mainland relatives, they swim in the ocean and eat algae and seaweed. Their bodies are dark, which helps them absorb heat from the sun after diving for food in the cold water surrounding the Galapagos. The ancestors of these iguanas probably floated here a long time ago. These islands are mostly desert with just a few leafy trees, so iguanas that were able to eat algae in the water had a much better chance for survival. Adaptations usually develop over thousands or even millions of years, but some species can adapt much faster. So how does that happen? Well, let's go visit Sue's in Indiana as she tracks down some of the fastest adapting species on the planet. Insect populations can adapt quickly to changes in their environment because they have such short life cycles. I mean, some insects can only live a few days. So that means they can produce a large number of offspring in a short amount of time. So any beneficial traits that are passed on to the next generation might help the species survive. But how do farmers protect their crops from these insects? To find out more, we decided to ask an expert, farmer John Little in Lowell, Indiana. One of the safest ways is using Bt. That is a naturally occurring bacteria that will kill insects. And we can add it to our sprays. So when you spray this whole field, do you kill all the insects? No, not, not all of the insects. Many of the insects have resistance to many different pesticides. So then, in this field, if you had one species of worm that was just eating all of your peppers and you sprayed it, I mean, why is it that some of those would survive and some not? That is just due to the genetic variance between one uh, animal and another. So if the surviving insects reproduce and pass on their pesticide resistance traits to their offspring, they could produce a new generation that could infest this entire field. And when farmers try to kill them with the original pesticide, they won't die. So we have to develop a new mix of chemicals to spray. Some of these insects survive, and the pattern repeats. The bug population just keeps adapting to the chemicals. This is called pesticide resistance. Over time, this leads to insect populations that are more and more difficult to control. So science is pretty important in farming, too. Next time you're eating some salsa and chips, think about how much work went into protecting these crops from pests. And that adaptation and evolution are going on around us all the time, sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly. Another great reason to never stop exploring your world. So scientists don't really know why the red lip batfish has red lips. But generally, the adaptations an organism has helps it survive in its environment. Get together with your friends and make a list of the possible functions for the red lip adaptation in these fish. As we go forward, I just want to take a moment to remind you that Keep in mind how specific phenotypes in a population can increase probability of survival and lead to adaptation. Looking back at your success criteria, you will know you are successful when you can use evidence to explain cause and effect relationships between phenotypic adaptations and survival. In your activity, we are going to be looking at different bird beaks and how they have 
assisted with survival. We're looking at Darwin's finches. So notice the phenotypic variations within the finches. Once again, these are observable differences between the birds. In addition to the differences in beak, you should also notice the sources of food varies widely. You have hard nuts and seeds, insects, berries, cactus. Some also fed on leaves, nectar of flowers, and also blood of seabirds. The different phenotypic variation of these finches allow them to be more successful at feeding on different types of food. For example, the medium ground finch was very successful at feeding on seeds and nuts. Can you match what you think would be the best? Beat for different food sources. In this activity, you're going to need paper plate, cup, raisins, bird seed, paper clip, forceps, and a clothespin. There's many different alternative materials you can use, uh, such as chopsticks, toothpicks, tweezers, chip clip, spoon, maybe marshmallows, rice, or dry beans. As you'll see in a moment, uh, I used uh, tweezers and a large paper clip, some rice, and craisins, because that's what I had at home. Before you begin the activity, I want you to think. Look at your activity. Which beak do you think will work well for seeds? Which beak do you think will work well for insects? Write your answer on your lab sheet for number one. As you think about this, and you think about the phenotypic adaptations that can increase the probability of survival, work through this activity. Read through the uh, suggested protocol, but use only one hand and time each trial for 10 seconds. As you can see, I have the rice representing bird seed and also the craisins representing the insects. And so my first two trials, I used tweezers, which represented the pointed beak finches. Once again, use only one hand and time for 10 seconds each. With the pointed beak, how many pieces of bird seed can you get versus how many pieces uh, or how many different insects can you get? In the next trials, I used my, my blunted beak. I used a chip clip. Well, I guess this would be more of a large paper clip as my blunted beak. But once again, rice as my bird seed, craisins as my insects. Once again, only one hand and time each trial for 10 seconds. How many pieces of bird seed can you obtain? And how many insects can you obtain with the blunted beak clip? This is very important because as you think of the Galapagos Islands and e anywhere, there are climatic conditions that change from year to year. So there's going to be different accesses to food that would promote survival depending on the phenotypic adaptations of the different finches. With these differences in mind, review your answer to question number one on the lab activity sheet. Use the collected data and your knowledge of how specific phenotypes in a population can increase probability of survival and lead to adaptations. And answer the remaining questions. Don't forget to complete all answers on the activity sheet. Your answers can be checked at the KCS website under uh, the support resources tab. Please tweet all your learning at KCS Science, and don't forget to wash your hands and clean up. Thank you for joining me, the Activity 1 in the summer, and stay safe and healthy.